Hi there, how's it going? My name is Albert, and uh, this is How to Dance Liquid, episode, uh, what, eight? Yeah, and uh, today, uh, I'm going to be talking about something that, in the beginning, might seem crazy and overwhelming and impossibly difficult, uh, but I'm going to give you a really nice framework through which to do it. Um, and at first, it might not seem like it's related to liquid that much, but with this framework and with what I'm going to talk to you about, I think it's super important, and I know a lot of really good liquid people are really into this topic for very good reasons. So that uh, topic today is how to tut, or tutting, and uh, the main sort of theoretical topic with regards to that practice of tutting is what the grid is and how the grid can be used. Um, and I'm just going to talk about you know the practice of tutting, some mechanics of the grid, uh, and uh, I'm going to try to tie that back into everything that we've talked about so far. And uh, I'm going to talk about how that's, uh, you know, how you can sort of incorporate that into your, into your flow, into your liquid. So uh, let me clarify a few terms first. If you have no idea what tutting is, no problem. Tutting is basically, uh, the term tut comes from King Tut, or Tutan, Tutan, Com, Tutan Comet? I don't know. King Tut, you know, the Egyptian god, or... Egyptian king way back in the day. And if you look at old Egyptian paintings or whatever, you know, everyone's like walking around at 90 degree angles. So if you, you know that song, I think it's back in the 80s, Walk Like an Egyptian, and then you got all these people, these goofy, you know, old people just sort of doing a, walking like an Egyptian, right? That's sort of the idea of King Tut, but it's sort of, uh, I'm assuming that the form of tutting has, has is, earlier than that particular song, because that song is whack. <laughs> In any case, here, here it is, uh, sort of like a quick sense of what tutting looks like. Okay, cool. Uh, and so, uh, I can imagine you saying, especially if you're a beginning liquid dancer, how, what does that have anything to do with liquid? Um, so, I'm going to doesn't matter, you know, just hold on to that question for later. I promise I'll address it. Uh, just put your faith in me. <laughs> and uh, just, I'm going to teach you a very basic understanding of how to get into tutting. Now, one of the problems with tutting that I had, especially as a beginner, was like, you see these sick, sick tutters. And like, when you see sick tutters, your mind gets blown because it's like impossible what they're doing, right? I mean, they're like moving through space at like crazy, dangerously fast speeds. Um, and... And you're like, how do I even, like, what do I, there's, there's like no connection, like, at least when you see, or at least when I saw beginning liquid people, I'm like, oh, okay, I could, like, play with that at least. I can imagine aspiring to do that. But when you see really fast tutters, or really good tutters, you're like, oh, my God, there's no way, no way I will ever be that good. Um, and so I would say, first of all, put that fear aside, because uh, you can't fixate on that. And I had to stop fixating on that. Uh, and, <laughs> and instead try to learn like a few fundamentals, right? So I, I felt that way for a very long time. And then I just, I, I hung out with a few people who were very informative and they taught me a lot of really important sort of fundamental perspectives on, on, the, on how to tut. And that has reshaped not only my ability to bust out a few tuts while I'm dancing, uh, but also it has completely sort of reshaped how I do liquid and waving. <clears throat> um, so anyway, the first thing that was sort of introduced to me that kind of very heavily changed how I taught it was uh, I, I, there's this guy named Hadouken, uh, and he taught me something that he taught he was learned he was taught from a guy named Shifted Shapes, which is what is known as a scale. And um, it operates, well, let me just show you what the scale is. Cool. That's what the scale is. It's just a progression of tuts that goes from here, from here all the way up to here, right? Um, and that progression, you know, I mean, if you just practice this over and over again, that's called practicing your scales, right? And, and I think the idea of it being a scale is super uh, appropriate.
appropriate because I learned piano a long time ago, and when I learned piano, I learned how to, I learned by practicing my scales. And you know, a scale in and of itself, you don't always use it. There are a lot of piano pieces that don't actually have any scales, right? Uh, so you could imagine saying, well, I don't know why I need to practice my scales because like, I just want to play this particular song and it doesn't have any scales in it. But really what you're doing is you're just warming up your fingers to get them on a keyboard so that you can get comfortable with moving around up and down in this, on, this, on the porcelain, right? I mean, you, in the beginning, you know, when you just encounter a piano for the first time, you have no idea how to handle it. So a scale is a really great way to just familiarize yourself with putting your fingers on the keys and moving sort of, sort of elegantly, right? Um, <clears throat> there are a bunch of other different patterns that people practice in, in piano um, to, to get you sort of accustomed to different things. And that, all that sort of training has been imbued in the piano learning culture because they've had a long time to do it. Uh, and they know that scales and chords and, and you know, different types of scales and different types of chords are all really great pieces of training. Uh, and so this is what I'm saying about the Tut scale, or what I've been taught about the Tut scale. This is just a sort of a piece of training. It in itself isn't necessarily dance, but it in itself is the ability to move comfortably through, um, through space in what is known as the Tut grid. Now, before I continue, I want to touch back really quickly on something I mentioned two episodes ago, and that is the, the idea of proprioception. Um, so in the episode where I was talking about how to go from, you know, small, you know, in, like in front of you sort of patterns to large patterns, I sort of threw in this term proprioception without qualifying it, and that was a mistake. I really should have addressed what it means. Um, so in grade school, most of us are taught that there are five senses to the human body, right? We have sight, smell, taste, touch, and hearing. Um, but in fact, that's not really... If you ask a scientist, or if you, I've consulted Wikipedia, and apparently, according to Wikipedia, uh, the question of what is a sense is sort of debatable. Um, obviously, we have a sense of balance, so how come that's not qualified in the five senses, right? We have a bunch of senses, and, and one of those senses, uh, and the one that I want to talk about, and the one that I brought up earlier, was a sense of proprioception. Now, proprioception is the ability to tell how your body is oriented. So if you were to knock me out and blindfold me and rub Novocaine all over my body so I couldn't physically feel anything, uh, I'd be able to wake up and tell you kind of roughly how my body is oriented, right? As long as you didn't give me crazy drugs that, that like made me completely space out and do weird things. But for the most part, right, if I have my sense of proprioception, then, you know, when I come to, even though I'm blindfolded and I can't feel anything, uh, you could put cotton in my ears and, and put an apple in my mouth and whatever, like plug my nose. I'd still be able to tell you, yeah, my hands are roughly like a foot apart from each other. Or, um, yeah, like my knee and my elbow, maybe like 18 inches or so, right? So, so the, this sense is called proprioception. And obviously as a dancer, it's a super important sense to have. Uh, and when it comes to taking these small liquid forms that are always in front of your face and blowing them out into everything out here, uh, this is where you stop relying on your visual sense and you start to rely on what is known as your proprioceptive sense, right? The ability to say um, that, that like my body is oriented in this particular manner uh, and it's still really interesting the work that I'm doing out there, right? So, it, you know, you need to rely more heavily on your proprioceptive sense uh, and, and learning how to do tuts is a really great way to, to sort of scaffold your way out here. Um, it's, it's kind of scary when you start, right? It's kind of scary only because everything is in this super controlled environment in front of your eyes. You can see everything that you're doing. When, when you start going out here, you can get really sloppy if you're not careful, right? Because uh, there's just so much space out here and it's super easy to get lost and then you're just sort of dancing in a very airy style. Uh, not to say that that's necessarily bad. Uh, it's only to say if you want this sort of conformity and control in your liquid, uh, and you want to maintain that all the way out here, it might be useful to have uh, a little bit of an understanding of the architecture of how space out here is arranged. 
So that's what Tutting teaches you, <coughs> and and that's what this this scale does, right? So um, to take a step back from the scale and just to, to sort of cover the theory of, of Tutting for a second, um, the let's see. It, the tut space is often described on a grid. This is known as the grid. Uh, and the grid is this, a, a really great way to think about it is you've got a big piece of graph paper on top of this video that you're looking at. Uh, down here on this video is the origin of the grid. Along here is, is an axis, right? That goes, it's the x axis and that's positive and that's positive y, right? And on this grid, you have little pieces, you have like little lines that sort of divide the grid this way and this way, right? <clears throat> so now you're looking at me through a, a piece of graph paper, um, and what I'm going to do as a tutter is I'm going to fix different joints on my body to those points on that graph paper, right? So now this is, this is how we maintain this three-dimensionality, or sorry, not the three-dimensionality, the, the ability to hit all these 90-degree angles. We just practice being on top of this grid all the time. It's really weird, right? It's a weird practice to have. Um, but there are a few tricks that'll help you understand how this grid operates, right? First of all, let's talk about this grid in terms of the unit, right? <coughs> so on graph paper, usually your units are going to be like four ticks per inch or maybe like five ticks per inch or whatever, or maybe a tick every other, every half centimeter. I don't know. In any case, <coughs> Here, uh, the, the unit that we're going to be working with is uh, what I've heard to refer as the tut unit, um, which is basically the distance from your wrist to your elbow, right? This is one unit. Um, if you look at the anatomy of the human body, the distance from the wrist to the elbow is, is pretty much the same distance from the elbow to the shoulder, right? Um, it's also about twice the distance from your fingertip to your wrist, right? So two hands make up one unit, or one hand makes up half a unit. And also, if you get really nerdy and, and silly, you can say that if this is a full, if this is half a unit, right, then this is a quarter unit, and so is this, right? And also, if you want to get nerdier than that, you can also say that this is an eighth of a unit and this is an eighth of a unit. Um, so yeah, that's that's sort of how the grid sort of operates, and and that means that you have the ability to. Uh, you have the tools now to be able to hit these grid shapes, right? To, to hit on top of what is known as the grid, to sort of snap to grid. Uh, and, and that ability, um, that, you know, that, that ability gives you sort of the confidence to move around out here in three-dimensional space. Now, I say three-dimensional, I use the, the two-dimensional grid as a metaphor, but <coughs> really another way to think about it is if we took, let's see, Actually, that might be good. If you look over here in this room, whoa, where do I go here? Okay, yeah, down here we have like these little shoe cubbies that go all the way across. Each one of those are like one unit. Over here we have these like posts. Here's a post, here's a post, here's a post. So this is one dimension, this is another dimension, and this is the third dimension, right, going up and down. So imagine that not only, uh, imagine that the, the third dimension also had tick marks, right? So that's, that's what we imagine in the three-dimensional grid. Uh, so not only, you know, not only is there this stuff, but you can also break out and go forward and backward as well. Anyway, so yeah, we, we use this as a way to practice your scales, as a way to traverse on top of this grid, just sort of to get you familiar <coughs> and to have a bunch of, um, uh, a bunch of little, um, yeah, to get you familiar and to, to have a way to traverse through space and you get kind of stuck, right? But really, what, what I think it, it develops is this sense that, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I'm definitely on the grid. And then if you sort of do a manipulation and you're like, end up here, you're like, hmm, not quite on the grid. Like, I can kind of feel it, right? Either this has to go down here or up here, and then this needs to, like, be over here or here, right? It's fine if you're not on the grid, as long as you're just sort of aware of it, right? Um, the grid is just sort of like a, a place for you to snap to if you get lost and want a little bit of architecture to help you out. <clears throat> so, 
this this scale, right? <coughs> I would say, like, why don't you go ahead and, and practice along with me? Uh, I'm just going to count them off. By the way, uh, there are a bunch of different ways or styles that people sort of present these scales. I, I mean, I don't think any of them are. I think I like the one that I do, but I'm not particularly married to it. Um, <clears throat> but it's just sort of how I was taught. Uh, some people have different alter all. Some people have different alterations, but all that's important is that you sort of do something and use it as a way for you to traverse these spins. So, this scale <clears throat> starts here. I'm just going to count it off. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Easy, right? <clears throat> Once again, I'm just going to go through the muscle memory motions, just the pure mechanics of it, and then I'm going to talk about a little bit more theory about it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Great. Now, <coughs> excuse me, a little bit of <coughs> theory behind this. Uh, the, <coughs> man, huh. <clears throat> okay, so here we have, as you traverse through the scale, you're going to notice that you're going to be alternating with fixed point, uh, sort of every other time, mostly. So here, my fixed point is going to be my wrist, and I go from here to here, right? So all of my body is static up until my wrist, and my wrist hinges here, right? It doesn't curl across like that. I'm hinging. When I'm in the touch space, I'm always going to be hinging off of my fixed point, right? So here I'm going to be hinging off my wrist. Now I'm going to change my fixed point to my elbow and hinge off of my elbow. So this will just be a hinge off of the elbow, but instead of just doing that, I'm also going to introduce a hinge off of this. <clears throat> so that's just a complicated way of saying my fingertips are always going to be pointing at my at this hip here, right? Fingertips at the hip, fingertips towards the hip, right? Another way to imagine this is this is one corner of a square, this is another corner of a square, here's a third corner of a square, and here's the fourth corner, and all I'm doing is describing this side and this side the first time, and then I'm describing this side and this side the second time. So here I'm building a square, <clears throat> right? And, another, and so if you take that model, here is this square underneath my forearm. Now if I, the next move in the sequence is to fix on the elbow, or sorry, on the wrist and point upwards. Now the square is above my forearm. <clears throat> and you do the exact same thing as before. You move your forearm to be here and your hand to be like this. We're just describing another square, right? <clears throat> so we're here. One, two, three. So two and three describe the bottom square. So one, two, three. And then four and five describe the top square. Four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Now, the next step would be to, um, uh, instead of hinging, so I'm sort of, so here we go. Hinge off the wrist, hinge off the elbow, hinge off the wrist, hinge off the elbow. Now I'm going to hinge off my shoulder, right? And, just, and notice that this sort of goes in a, in a hingy circular path up here. I'm fixing not only my shoulder, it's, well, because I'm fixing my shoulder, I'm also fixing my, my, um, my wrist because it's associated with it. And I also happen to be fixing my fingertips. <clears throat> Sorry, my screen keeps turning off. <clears throat> oh, it's because I took the power out. Great. So, from here to here, I hinge off my, my shoulder. Now I'm going to, you know, I, uh, the way I like to model this is you have the square here. You hinge off the shoulder, and all you're doing is you're preparing to lift this square up to here. Right? This square that we described here, right? Or here, I'll do that. Now this square is going to go up here. This is now, uh, so that's 
One, two, three, four, five, six. Take the square, move it up, seven. Now I'm going to describe the opposite square, right? So this is the forearm, the square between my forearm and my head. That's seven, and then eight is the square outside over here. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Now I'm going to hinge off of my shoulder again and use this whole thing is going to say static. Boom. I would definitely suggest checking out in a mirror whether or not this is actually a 90s. <clears throat> I also uh, would work on flexibility if you can. <clears throat> I'm not super flexible, but you know I'm doing my best. I'm hinging from here to here. And then some people like to just go from here to the top square, like that, because you're already describing a square. I like to add in a little bit of articulation here to go up and then pop out. Doesn't really matter as long as you're just like going through the motions to try to move through space in a gridded fashion. Right? So that should get you familiar. <clears throat> and once you get that down, um, you can you should start definitely start practice with your left arm because you need to sort of explore this space over here. And you can do them together. Also, what's interesting is that uh, we are working on the X, Y. If we want to work along the Z, the, this depth, or however you want to describe it, if you want to work on the forward, backward, um, what you can do is you can just take this sort of beginning shape, and instead of pointing outward, you point backwards, and you do the whole pattern sideways. So this is going to be pretty boring for you from the camera's perspective. So I'm going to, I'm going to turn my whole body and do the exact same pattern. Uh, you know, pointing forward and backwards. Now, this also means that you can, you know, do this and then sort of halfway through transition in by twisting and rotating uh, this whole. So you have the, you know, you're tutting along this plane, and as, if you rotate it uh, based on your your shoulder your shoulders rotation then you can basically do a lot of the pattern in different dimensions, basically, right? Or, yeah, in different dimensions. Um, and so I would, you know, encourage you to not only practice that scale, but also uh, there are a bunch of other scales out there. I don't know if people call them scales. Uh, there's this thing that I learned. There are two scales that I learned from this dancer icon, uh, and one of them is, I'm not going to show you the mechanics of it, uh, I mean, I'm only going to show you me doing it. I'm not going to teach you how to do it because it's kind of complicated. But it's beautiful. I love it because it, it helps me move through three-dimensional space. And it has really shaped, helped shape my tutting in, in a new, interesting way. And then if, you know, we take all this, you know, we have this big uh, space that we're exploring. And uh, the whole point is that you're, as I said before, you're sort of developing your proprioceptive sense through this sense of architecture. And what happens eventually is that like, you, you feel the grid. I mean, like you just feel the grid. I don't know how else to explain it. You just get there. Um, and what's so scary from me as a liquid dancer was when I approached it, I was like, oh my god, that tutting stuff is super hard. Um, and it's just a completely different learning process. You're not learning necessarily from your eyes. You're learning by what feels like it's on a grid. I mean, it's it's just a different. It's it's this proprioceptive sense, and it's just completely different, right? Um, so when you develop that, though, you have this sick tool set, right? Because then that means you can sort of incorporate all the other liquid stuff that you've been doing into this grid space, especially when you want to get your liquid out bigger, right? So for example, um, rails. Well, first of all, when you do a rail, there's this good old classic trick called a, um, uh, uh, called a trace, I think. Uh, <clears throat> and the idea behind a trace is that you are using a rail to outline the shape of something, right? So here I'm using a rail to outline the shape of my body, right? Um, now, this, these tracing patterns are, are uh, it's very nice to sort of outline the shape of your body because it's architecture that's already there, 
But if you already have the, the tuck grid sort of installed in your uh, sort of installed in your RAM, or, or like if you have this like this tuck grid sort of already in your muscle memory, then it's easy to use this tuck grid space to give you the ability to build these rails in large sort of three-dimensional spaces that uh, have structure to them, have coherence, and have the ability to transform into tuts if you need them to. So it's not too difficult to transform, to like do uh, a tut pattern and then transition into a rail pattern, right? Or, or a more classic liquid pattern. <clears throat> um, and then, oh, the other scale, I guess, or, or the other sort of routine that I learned from Icon was this thing called the, uh, that he called the controller. Uh, and I'm just going to do it. I'm not going to actually show you how to do it. But you should be able to, s I'll do it slowly, so if you want to, you can practice this by yourself. Right. So uh, what's super awesome about this is that now we're exploring like the, the smaller spaces with these tuts. And surprisingly, actually, even though I'm a super visual person, when it gets down here, you still kind of have to rely on your proprioceptive sense. At least this is my experience. You have to rely on a sense that you're actually on a grid. Like you need to. So when you start playing around with different shapes with your hands, um, this this structured approach is super useful because it gives you the ability uh, to say, "I'm not lost. I know exactly where I am." Right. So this particular pattern here uh, is another. Um, way to traverse space. That's all it is, right? Uh, and when you sort of get this installed, that means you have interesting uh, spatial traversions. Traversions? You, you have really interesting ways to move around in this space. Uh, and there's another one that I wanted to show you, which was like, my, if you take your hand out, uh, each hand is described by an L, so from my fingertip to my, the center of my hand to my thumb tip, uh, there are three individual focal points, and here this hand also has three. And if you notice that now I'm just going to like trace the fingertip along this L, and now I'm going to trace my thumb along this L. And this gives you a bill, and, and then if you, you know, twist on different focal points, uh, that gives you the ability to do interesting transpositions. I guess. You can also you know, twist and rotate and do cool things. There's a lot to be done with that. So what this does is it, you know, it gives you an architecture for your hands. So if you're in the middle of doing like a liquid set and you go into folds, now you have this, you know, this architecture, and it gives you like a really nice way to start playing around with space in a way that's structured. Um, I love doing these things. Oops. I don't know who I saw do this first, but it's, it, you know, this is all sort of like based on this grid structure stuff. Uh, you know, once you can snap to these structures, then you can really, um, then you can really explore space in, in new cool ways. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> let's see, I think that's about it. Uh, I think I covered all the things that I wanted to talk about. Um, yeah. Uh, next week, I'm going to talk about popping. Um, or next, you know, next episode, I'm going to talk about popping. And uh, uh, tune in for that if you like what you saw here. Uh, <clears throat> please post a comment if you have any questions or, or want to send, if you want me to give you feedback on some video or whatever, hit me up. Like below, you know, click a button or whatever, or subscribe, tell your friends, uh, and thanks for tuning in, and uh, hopefully I've helped you become a slightly better dancer. So yeah, take, take, you know, take the tut space, learn the space out here, get familiar with it, and it will uh, enhance all of your liquid, especially if you can't see any of it, because it's just too, too big, um, which is where you should be. All right, cheers, peace.